losses and statistics are only the black and white of a season. A team's personality provides color. Jets got very tough for a week 12 encounter with a playoff bound Houston Oilers. Bruce Harper countered a furious Houston comeback in the fourth quarter of a game destined to be an overtime cliffhanger. The last second rescue was engineered by Pat Lake. <laughs> On this Sunday in November, the personality of the 1980 New York Jets finally crystallized. Out of their youth and inexperience had grown a core of confident exuberance. I've always kind of looked up to Sabler, and it, you know, gives me a big thrill to get back there and be able to, to uh, sack him. So I really, I enjoyed myself tonight. You know, it was a lot of fun out there coming back. I think we all had confidence in the huddle. This is, this is a cigar from the president, Jim Kinsel. Feels pretty good. Well, they, everybody seemed to, you know, come to the rescue, and uh, we didn't give up. And that's, I think that's very important to the Jets right now. Throughout 1980, the Jets never gave up. If one faltered, another often assumed control. Sometimes a single Jet rebounded in a decisive display of second effort. Pro football is a risky venture, a game of guts and gamble. Teams that tried long shots against the Jets often came up short. The Jets played with their heads up and with their hands up. These Jets were maturing and had muscles to flex. The Jets found that the road to maturity was not without its pitfalls. Yet the Jets kept bouncing back to rise above adversity. The New York Jets worked at forging a new identity for their future. That identity will draw on a tough, determined spirit that brought color to their 1980 season. New York fans found that the Jets' tough defense was worth shouting about. Stopping the running game was the primary objective of the young line backing core. In the middle, Stan Blinka learned valuable lessons and taught a few of his own in only his second season. At 
outside linebacker Ron Crosby, number 55, also learned in 1980, as did third-round draft choice Lance Mel, number 56, and even defensive captain Greg Butler. Now our middle linebacker Stan Blank is a year, year older, he's learned, he's a smart kid, he's a, he's a good linebacker, and uh, Ron Crosby's a young kid, and he's learned from last year, and uh, even myself, you know I'm the oldest one on defense, I've still learned from last year, and our defensive improvement has really been phenomenal as compared to what it was last year. We are twice as good as we were last year. This year we're getting pass rush as compared to really no pass rush from last year, I think that's the big turnaround on our defense. It is said that every picture tells a story. These four young giants were a picture of efficiency, and their stories revitalized the Jets' pass rush. For Marty Lines, number 93, it was a story of awesome potential. Steadiness was the story of Abdul Salam, number 74. There was also the story of a famous baby face that belied a fine madness. Joe Klecko's Jekyll and Hyde act had monstrous consequences for opposing quarterbacks. In his quest for sacks, Klecko wielded the hammer of Thor. The Jets registered their highest total of quarterback sacks since 1970. The team leader in sacks was Mark Gastineau, who became one of the NFL's most proficient pass rushers. to know blended quickness, strength, and desire with a skill uncommon for a second-year pro. No second-year men are discussed in terms of their future. 1980 proved that Mark Castano's future is now. offense took over, they relied on a ground attack that produced vital yardage. In a cast of many performers, number 25, Scott Durking, emerged as the team's leading rusher. Durking shared the team lead in touchdowns with number 33, Kevin Long, who seemed tougher when the field got shorter. Tom Newton, number 44, gained 117 yards against New Orleans, the Jets' high for 1980. He unleashed his power on other teams as well. Richard Todd helped herald the return of the running quarterback in the NFL by averaging nearly seven yards per carry. Todd led all AFC quarterbacks in rushing yardage and touchdowns. This running attack, so vital to the Jets' offensive strategy, enjoyed its finest 60 minutes in Atlanta during week six. In his first start of the season, Kevin Long gained 100 yards against what was then the NFL's best rushing defense. Facing a team destined for a division championship, Long scored one touchdown, and Scott Durking added the other, as the Jets earned their first victory of the season. occasions in 1980, Shea Stadium was brought to life. It got especially lively when the Jets took to the air, propelled by their versatile backs. Coming
coming out of the backfield to lead the team in receptions and receiving yardage was number 42, Bruce Harper. set an AFC record with 17 receptions against San Francisco. Before a broken leg sidelined him for the year, Gaines led the Jets in rushing and the AFC in receptions. A successful rehabilitation promises that Clark Gaines will be a force of the future. The Jets were not lacking in deep threats. When healthy, number 85, Wesley Walker, flashed the form that has made him one of the NFL's premier wide receivers. Number one draft choice, Johnny Lamb Jones, number 80, averaged nearly 20 yards per reception. Jones, number 89, admirably shouldered the burden of Wesley Walker's absence, as did Derek Gaffney, number 81. Complementing these wide receivers were tight ends Mickey Shuler, number 82, and Jerome Barkham, number 83. Richard Todd provided the icing on this passing attack. Kissed by a rare competitive spirit, Todd set a Jets single season completion record. And an NFL single game record of 42 completions against San Francisco. Richard Todd accounted for over half of the Jets' touchdowns in 1980, and he is distinguished by his continued determination to perfect his skills. A respected offensive line spelled out Jet toughness. Number 65, Santa Joe Fields, led a bulldozing fleet that included durable guard Dan Alexander and tackle Chris Ward, number 72, while reserves stand Waldemore, John Roman, number 61, and Guy Bingham added depth. Tackle Marvin Powell, number 79, again earned all pro honors. But Powell feels he needs to display another facet of team play. We have great leaders and Randy Rasmussen and uh, Greg Buttle so forth, but uh, I think it's time for my class, you know, Wesley Walker, myself, Kevin Long, to start coming out and just taking control out there because we can play this game very well. Offensive captain Randy Rasmussen played the game very well indeed in his 14th season as the Jets guard. was an old hand that fit in with new faces like Johnny Lamb Jones, who found that being a highly touted draft choice made him a marked man. But Walt Michaels knew that Jones would recover. Johnny's got the kind of ability and elusiveness to where he can avoid those head-on shots. Uh, he's going to get himself through that. I don't uh, doubt that one bit. It's just a matter of him knowing that he can go in there and knowing that he can come out of that uh, inside area alive. That's the biggest thing, and I'm sure he's gonna learn it. This season of self-discovery points to a bright future for Lamb Jones. Second round draft pick Darrell Ray, number 28, added a bright new look at safety. 
proved to be a scrapper who was not about to let go of an opportunity to start. Another new face in the starting secondary was number 48, Ken Troy, who in week five became a regular after three seasons of special team duty. Troy's eight interceptions were the highest total for a Jet in 10 years. Ken Troy and Darrell Ray filled in the missing pieces in a Jets puzzle. And Ray picked up the pieces of a puzzling play in the season's first game. While Ray's 75-yard touchdown came in a losing cause, he was destined to end the season as he began it, with a Jet victory as the result. Miami's Don Shula is a recognized coaching success, but for the third straight season, he has failed to beat the Jets under Walt Michaels. Richard Todd and Scott Durkin ignited the Jets in a Monday night encounter with the Dolphins at Shea. The defensive assault was led by Mark Gastineau and by number 93, Marty Lyon. Donald Dyke's first pro interception contributed to a 17-14 win, the Jets' second consecutive Monday night victory at home. Eight weeks later in Miami, Dykes demonstrated that lightning does strike twice. The Jets and Darrell Ray snatched a 24-17 win from Miami. They're sixth in a row against the Dolphins. The Jets obviously saw this contest as more than a season finale with nothing at stake. While Ray's heroics garnered him praise in 1980, Walt Michaels looked for similar deeds from an unsung hero in the secondary. Bobby Jackson, number 40 the quiet man whose deeds spoke forcefully. While punter Chuck Ramsey was another unsung hero, it was the Jets' punt returner who raced into the limelight in 1980. In his fourth pro season, Bruce Harper led the AFC in combined yardage for the fourth time. In 1980, he led the entire NFL as he took on additional offensive duty. gained more receiving yardage than any back in the NFL. Bruce Harper not only produced key plays, he produced excitement. His teammates elected him as the Jets' most valuable player. In week 12, the Jets were relaxed and ready for the Houston Oilers, who were riding a five-game winning streak. In this tight contest, Hopper turned a Richard Todd screen pass into a 45-yard touchdown. Throughout 
with the game the Jets stood up to the AFC's top rushing team and brought it down. The Jets intercepted four passes. Ken Troy's was good for 82 yards and a touchdown. Jets also recovered two Houston fumbles, and Mark Gastineau registered three of the team's four sacks. Big plays were a matter of course. Ron Crosby's interception set up a Kevin Long score. But Houston was fighting for its playoff life, and the veteran team evened matters at 28 apiece to send the game into overtime. To get Pat Leahy into field goal range for Walt Michaels' first overtime victory, the Jets again called on their most valuable player. Leahy's 38-yard field goal gave the Jets an unexpected 31-28 win. By withstanding a flurry of knockout punches from one of the NFL's heavyweight teams, the Jets evidence a fierce fighting spirit. There is every indication that this spirit will prevail in the seasons ahead. The New York Jets are advancing toward what should be a promising future. Then, as now, it will surely be possible to color them tough.